Hello. Hi again. The last time we left off with the question of how does the church grow, stabilize, and unify? And we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. This time I'm going to read from the New American Standard Version. We wanted to do a brief recap, though, of church history up until the writing of Ephesians because Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, is uh, one of the late developments of Paul's third missionary tour. By the time Ephesus and Ephesians are central to his ministry, the whole book of Acts has already happened. As far as we can tell, when he writes Ephesians, Acts is in the can. Mm -hmm. Luke has already written it. That may not be the case, but the Acts, that is the the things that Luke is recording in Acts, have all happened already. Mm -hmm. So when you look back over the entire contents of Acts and start to fill in some of the other stuff we know from Paul's epistles that happened during the same period, you see this pattern of instability and immaturity and lack of unity already. For instance, going back in the early chapters of Acts, you have not only the the persecution of the church in Acts 4 and 5, the heavy Jewish or uh, division between what we could call Orthodox Judaism and the early church emphases, although they're still attending the temple during this entire period and apparently still going to synagogues. So they haven't broken with Judaism. Mm -hmm. So not only the disunity with their fellow Jews, but you see hypocrisy in yeah, the, the story of... Of Ananias, the development of hypocrisy trying to, to uh, lie to the Spirit. The light of the Spirit of God, that's Acts chapter 5. Mm -hmm. And then you have also the persecution that happens in 4 and 5. And then it's chapter 6. I think we mm -hmm. should look at this verse specifically. Acts yeah. 6 verse 1. Okay. Because it illuminates a problem we don't normally think about. If, if we do have an awareness of the problems in the early church, we don't think much about this one. Okay. Acts this 6 1. I can read this one, but from the New World Translation, I'll yeah. read it. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing, a murmuring arose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebrew-speaking Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. Now, we might also put a side glance into verse 7, where it, a kind of a odd point is mentioned here that doesn't seem to be related to the rest and that is the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly why Luke in intrudes the point here except that it might have something to do with what we're reading mm -hmm. in the first verse and also the story of Stephen that follows the first martyrdom. Yeah. Because the tension that the church inherits from Judaism is between the most Judaizing aspect of the church, the Hebrew-speaking believers, including the priests who would serve in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and these Hellenists who at this time were by far the majority of mm -hmm. Jews in the world. And even in Galilee, Hellenism had completely taken over, and that meant that the synagogues were reading from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew. Yeah. So and, and their services were in Greek, not in Aramaic. So there's a potential of conflict, right? at the very beginning, just with the Jewish Christians. Yeah. But from two, two different, uh, taking two different uh, uh, slants at things. Culture. Culture. It wasn't ethnic divide. It wasn't blood. It was culture. That is language. It starts, right. with, starts with language. So mm -hmm. you see the division in verse 1 is between, uh, well, it's a complaint that, that somehow the, the Jewish element, the real Jewish element of the early church, is getting favors more than the the element that, that some Christians, early Christians, like some Jews, would have felt is a kind of a compromised Judaism, mm -hmm. Hellenism. Yeah. So that plays out in the death of Stephen, and then it leads, of course, to the the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Right. So by the time you get into the 40s, this hasn't died away. It's it's got worse. It would seem because you have these men coming down from. James, or Jerusalem anyway, and making trouble for the church in Antioch, which brings about the the Jerusalem Council and that emergency session, as it were, where they had to decide, do you have to be a Jew before you can become a Christian? Mm, right. So that's yeah. the Jewish element in the yeah. division of the early church. Yeah. And, then, and then by the time you get to Corinthians, about five years after that, 54, 55 AD, you can see when 
Paul is Paul and Barnabas have begun the the uh, Gentile churches, although they're primarily Jewish at this point, but with a, a very large number of Gentiles already attached. Then you have Gentile problems coming into the church. With, yeah, a kind of a different set of problems for them because of their culture. Yeah. So it it uh, gives them a looser view of uh, sexual morality. Yeah. They have the problem with idol worship. Yeah. Because that was their culture, worshiping the different gods. Uh, so, and, and disunity as well, favoring different people. But who would have thought, as a Jehovah's Witness, I didn't think of any conflict in the early church. It was the perfect church. Right. Uh, this totally dismantles that. Yeah. Uh, we uh, did a series some years ago at our church in Mississauga, and it was based around Acts 2, Mm -hmm. which we just touched upon, the beginning of the church at Pentecost, and uh, the mother church that existed in those early years before the martyrdom of Stephen. And it was based on Corinthians, and it was also centered on this text in Ephesians chapter 4. And we called the series Mother Church, Messy Church, Model Church. Right. And the three churches were Jerusalem, the early church, mm -hmm. Corinth, and Ephesus. So at this point, with that background, you can begin to see why Paul, when he writes Ephesians, already has this history. Right. He's lived most of this history himself. He mm -hmm. sees the potential for problems and even breakdown in the church. And so he emphasizes in this passage, which we'll read now, okay. unity, stability, and maturity, and how they interrelate. Okay. So a new American standard. Uh, Ephesians 4, 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work, the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causing the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Oh, do I read 17 as well? No. Okay. I think we can end there. And it would be good for us all to process this because when you're a witness, you don't see how Paul sees the interrelationship of unity, maturity, and stability. Mm -hmm. It's very clear from this passage that he doesn't think even love can work properly if you don't honor these principles, which have to do with the foundation principle of all religion and the difference between denominations and the difference between Christendom and the cults. And that's the issue of authority. If you don't accept Paul's notion of authority and how Christ works in the church, everything else goes wrong. Mm. That's the way he sees it. So can we have stability, mm. maturity, and unity? Notice he puts unity first in this list. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we can have, he says, without the others. Right. So I think before we do the next segment, we should all meditate, as it were, do a little homework in processing how Paul sees this combination 
of essentials and how they all rest and depend upon the principle of unity which is outlined specifically in verse 11 the gifts in men right. what are the gifts in men that Paul says are essential to our unity stability and maturity okay the next segment